Hello everyone, and today we continue to our second part of a lecture program of online laboratory and residency of thinking and learning new sonic series and practices. And we're really happy that you're with us tonight and that you join us for our program. And I'm more than grateful to present our speaker, Ksenia Majorova, and her topic for today's lecture is going to be a new philosophy of sound, ontological democracy, and multisensory approach. And Ksenia Majorova is a philosopher, researcher, fellow, and a lecturer at Higher School of Economics, both at the Zakovsky uh, Graduate School of Urbanism and a main program of sound art and sound studies. And her research interests include sound studies, urban studies, and a contemporary philosophy. And today she's going to speak about flat ontologies and multisensory epistemologies and how it could inspire us to reconsider the two main issues, two key issues that have been hunting sound studies ever since. And the first one is audiovisual litany, and the second one is sound hearing dilemma. And she will say about how those uh, new reconsiderations bring new questions and how to solve them. So we encourage you all to ask questions, and we will have a Q&A session afterwards. So you can write them down, whether in Zoom chat or YouTube chat. And um, Ksenia, the floor is yours. You can start your lecture now. Um, Olga, thank you very much for such an introduction. And I think like half a lecture, uh, half a lecture has already been given. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much for such informative introduction. Uh, and thank you all uh, to everyone who joined us today. I really hope that uh, my talk on um, recent tendencies in philosophy and how they might contribute um, to sound studies, uh, this uh, research field, I really hope that it, this would be of some interest for you. And I would also like to thank um, everyone, uh, all the people and all the institutions um, who made this uh, great event possible. Uh, yes, possible. Um, that's a very uh, big honor and a very big pleasure to speak here tonight and to learn from the colleagues um, throughout this amazing series of lectures. Um, so uh, let me begin my talk, and um, to do that, I need to uh, to run the presentation. Hope that you see that. Um, so the uh, name of my lecture, I named it as follows: a new philosophy of sound, ontological democracy, and multisensory approach. As um, some of you might have guessed, especially those who are interested in philosophies um, that are inspired by Gilles Deleuze, um, the title of my lecture refers to a famous book, um, a book called A New Philosophy of Society, Assemblage Theory and Complexity. Um, it was written by Manuel de Landa, and it was published in 2006. And um, let me first explain a little bit why have I put such an Easter egg to my uh, lecture title. Um, in that book, Manuel de Landa uh, explains the fundamentals of assemblage theory, uh, which he explicates from the last Guattarian works. Um, and in doing so, he formulates two general uh, points in which assemblage theory as um, a new philosophy of society, a proclaimed new philosophy of society, confronts ontological uh, premises um, uh, like, uh, of the classical um, or default theories of society. So there are default theories of society, default understandings of society, which he tries to uh, confront with his work. And um, this uh, main points are as follows. Um, assemblages, as he says, um, as Manuel de Landa says, are against totalities and against essences. Uh, so these are two ontological principles, totalities and essences. And um, these two principles interest us today in connection to our topic, to the topic of um, sonic uh, investigations, uh, because they presuppose and reproduce the hierarchy of being. And this is the thing that I am going to uh, speak a lot about 
uh, today. Uh, so totality presupposes that there is the whole and there are the parts. And uh, the part is ontologically smaller than the whole. Um, this means that part depends on the whole and uh, uh, parts are being totalized and um, included into the whole. Uh, and essences, um, as a second principle, uh, they presuppose that each thing uh, that exists in the world has its um, ontological core, which is uh, literally called um, essence. Uh, and things can be compared to each other and can be put into a hierarchy of being. So one thing, uh, because of um, this essence uh, might be uh, on a lower position in this hierarchy of being, another thing might be on a higher position. Uh, so what does essence mean? Essence means true being, uh, a being um, that exists truly, that is, exists authentically, uh, timelessly, uh, endlessly, and so on and so on. Uh, for example, actual humans um, as we are, like uh, embodied uh, humans who live in a specific uh, time in a specific place, uh, we are not true things, right? Because we are born and we die and uh, like we do not possess uh, or embody these essences as they are. Uh, but we have some essence inside our um, like uh, beings and it is soul and soul is uh, what exists forever. So soul is the essence. Well, I'm um, like reproducing the logic of this um, old understanding, right? So please do not consider that it's what I think um, or Delanda thinks, right? This is the logic that he opposes. Uh, or well, the same logic works with some physical things, right? The thing that we can see, the thing that we can touch is not a real thing because um, it uh, is like a mere shadow. Uh, of a real essence, and there is a real essence that exists uh, forever truly, authentically, and so on. Uh, and um, according to this logic, um, according to this old ontology, um, the real things that are not essences, that are shadows of the essences, they are not being put into consideration. Um, and essences are being put into considerations, and uh, essences um, is actually what is being put into that hierarchy of being. And we have some essences that are smaller, some essences that are more important, that are higher, and um, in a classical um, uh, uh, variant, we have uh, the biggest essence that is uh, the, uh, the very real essence, the most real essence, the essence that uh, exists um, more truly than anything else in the world. Uh, so for Delanda, such uh, logic, such ontology is false and um, it is irrelevant to the world that we live in. And what he proposes, and actually he's not alone, he is uh, being supported by uh, many other influential thinkers um, like Graham Harman, like Jan Bogast, like Levi Bryant. So what they all propose is flat ontologies. Uh, the term flat ontologies uh, was introduced uh, by Manuel de Landa in his uh, book for um, uh, Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy. Um, I'm not going to uh, read uh, this quotation, but what I want to say that um, we can meet uh, a very um, alike notion in under other names like uh, ontological democracy, uh, which actually um, I referred to in the title of my lecture as well, ontology, unit ontology, and so on. Uh, the main aim of this concept of flat ontologies or um, any other uh, names that we um, just discussed, uh, the, the main aim of this concept uh, is to resist reproducing, uh, reproducing this ontological hierarchy. All the entities that exist in the world are ontologically equal according to this flat approach. Um, how did such um, flat approach, such a shift from hierarchies to non-hierarchical uh, thinking, how uh, did it become possible? 
um, a very short uh, like historical thing. It might sound obvious to some of us, so I am sorry for um, for being uh, such um, obvious and thinking about such obvious things, but nevertheless, I think that it is important to pronounce. So all sorts of different crises and different um, like catastrophes that the global north faced uh, in the middle of the 20th century made us reconsider uh, or uh, initiated this global shift in understanding the world, uh, made us reconsider the privileged position of the classical default man. Um, that white uh, male, middle-aged, educated, and so on, so you name it, uh, man that used to be exceptional compared to all other things that exist in the world. Uh, the colonial thing, system crashed, uh, resulting in appearance of um, post-colonial theory, which made us see non-white peoples and cultures. Uh, the patriarchal system crashed, uh, resulting in a new wave of feminism and um, LGBTQ plus movement, which made us see non-male um, identities and rights. The ecological system struck back, resulting um, in a series of catastrophes and natural disasters, which made us see um, non-human agents and their needs. Uh, so the exceptional status of uh, the default man, uh, which actually uh, was uh, put um, on that um, uh, privileged position uh, and stayed there for a a uh, very uh, big period of time, very long period of time. So uh, the exceptional status of this man was questioned, um, which questioned classical ontological hierarchy, um, uh, which actually he um, was the very top of, right? And uh, those ontologies that uh, run the world for quite a long period of time, uh, they uh, were understood as unjust, unequal and irrelevant. Uh, so here, flat ontologies step into the game, um, and what they show, um, and here they follow Heidegger's ideas, and uh, a little bit later I will uh, address this in more details. So what they showed uh, was the fact that in classical thinking, two different scales were merged into one. Uh, the ontological and the ontic scales were not distinguished from each other. All things that were perceived as different uh, were uh, as different like for, for us, uh, for humans, from the human perspective. And we know that it's not like just human perspective, but a wild male um, man perspective and so on. Uh, so uh, the things that were considered to be different for us were considered to be different on their, um, uh, according to their position on the ladder of being. On, on that vertical line uh, where we have the lowest being um, uh, like on the bottom and uh, the highest being on the top. Um, actually, this is exactly what essentialist thinking is about. Um, essentialism insists that there are things that necessarily exist, just as I said earlier, um, and they, which means that they have more rights to exist, right? Uh, so Heidegger distinguished ontic from ontological and thus uh, made flat ontologies possible. Um, however, we know that uh, Heidegger himself was not a um, completely flat philosopher as long as he kept uh, design, right? This notion of design, uh, which is actually a trace of classical uh, modern Thinking. But nevertheless, he initiated this shift, he made it possible. He made this distinction that um, later uh, became a fundamental um, like basis for this flat ontology. So flat ontologies continued Heidegger's ideas and got rid of design. And according to flat ontologies, there are two different scales, ontic and ontological, and we see it on um, the right part of the um, uh, of the slide, right? On ontological level, we have all the entities that exist and quoting Jan Bogast, one of the representatives of flat ontology, uh, these entities equally exist. 
which means that they have equal ontological status and all the consequences like rights to be heard, uh, rights to be taken into account and so on. On the ontic level, that is um, uh, vertical, um, like arrows. Uh, on the ontic level, how, uh, however, continue uh, Jans Borger's quotation, these things do not exist equally which means that insisting on equal ontological position of all of the existing beings, we do not neglect their differences. Um, all the entities acquire a specific position with its specific point of view, right? So I am sorry for uh, using this visual metaphor uh, or their specific relations uh, with other uh, beings that exist in the world. We all have perspectives. Uh, and uh, the non-male, non-white, non-human, uh, even non-animate things in this ontology have their own perspective and have the right to be uh, heard and considered. Um, so this differentiation between ontological and otic is crucial for flat ontologies as it enables us addressing the differences and uh, doing that avoid discrimination. Uh, what I mean is that differences between entities, uh, between existing things, they stay, right? We do not exclude these differences. We do not um, like behave like they, these uh, differences do not exist, but well, they do stay uh, with all the, their asymmetric relations, with all their uh, attempts to compete for power and so on and so on. But all this happens on ontic level. Ontologically, all things are equal. Uh, and this equality is represented by the horizontal line. Um, so what is important to understand in this uh, reference to uh, the Landis uh, book um, in my lecture is that alike totalities and essences in philosophy of society for the Lande, there are basic ontological premises that haunt philosophies of sound. Uh, so um, next, I'm going to address those um, basic premises uh, in sound, uh, like not, not sound studies actually, in discourses about sound, uh, and try to show uh, the potential of um, two um, uh, like two tendencies in um, ontology and epistemology. I mean, flight ontology and multisensory studies. Um, tr we'll try to show their potential for further development of um, sonic uh, research. So uh, first, let me talk a little bit about uh, what I mean by old philosophy of sound. You know, if I am proposing um, some new philosophy of sound, this means that there are um, some old philosophies of sound. So um, as I explained in my recent article published in a special issue of Nipprikasnaviana Zapas journal that was edited by Yevgeny Bolina, uh, one of the orchestrators of uh, this series of lecture. Um, as I showed in that article, the general body of discourses about sound might be divided into two groups. Um, this is so because there are two major meta-narratives, and here I refer to uh, Leotard, uh, two major meta-narratives about uh, sound, which latently predetermine the possible ontological stances. The first meta-narrative is being shared by scientific fields uh, dealing with sound and sonic phenomena, such as physics, medicine, ecology, I mean general ecology, not acoustic ecology, uh, sound design, sound engineering, etc. Uh, for example, the practices of spectral analysis um, of sound um, that are being used to verify the geographical origin of the voice, uh, and they were um, addressed by Pedro Oliveira uh, several days ago. Uh, these practices of spectral analysis are based on such understanding of sound. I call this um, meta-narrative or, or this meta-understanding uh, sonic naturalism. And um, uh, as the core of this meta-narrative meta is constituted by belief in sound as a natural force. Uh, so this is a belief that sound has its natural characteristics and can be measured, counted, studied with the help of already existing scientific instruments. 
Um, as Salome Fergalen um, pointed out uh, last Saturday, a week ago, um, believing in that means um, using um, uh, or studying sound uh, with the means of classical science of Wissenschaft, right? Um, we are acquainted with the critique of such an approach, and we know that this uh, might be problematic. Starting sound with this uh, means might be problematic, at least because classical science and uh, the notion of truth are known to be formed uh, by visual thinking. And to know something for sure means uh, to see it, to make it visible. Uh, so the first meta narrative considers sound to be reachable. Uh, by this means, which means that it considers sound to be reachable by being visualized. Uh, so this is a reductionist approach. It reduces sound to the visual uh, and thus um, loses sound as a separate and non-visual phenomenon. So this is the first meta narrative. Um, this meta narrative tends to stay um, outside sound studies, we can say, right? Because these are uh, like uh, fields, uh, scientific fields, which deal with sound mostly. Um, and, and as for the second uh, meta narrative, the opposite meta narrative, uh, it built itself around critique of this naturalistic approach. So discourses that share this meta narrative uh, tend to emphasize the subjective part of sound, uh, that is listening. Uh, they speak about sonic experience, about ideologies and ethics performed by sonic practices, meanings and identities um, given the voice or silenced and thus, and thus cancelled um, by sonic policies. Um, these approaches speak about dominant patriarchal imperialistic rational discourses uh, which have dominated around the globe. All these are the principles, I mean, and pluralistic rational discourses uh, are the principles of uh, the now called classical thinking, which means colonial thinking, discriminatory thinking, ideologically charged thinking, uh, and finally visual thinking again. Uh, theory and objectivity constitute the core of this classical uh, epistemology. Um, and um, oh, thinking theoretically means alienating, being distanced. Uh, from the thing that you are trying to understand. Um, this uh, distance uh, between um, the subject and object in classical understanding contradicts the sound, right? Sound is what unites, is what connects, what mediates, uh, which means stands in between. Um, and as long as we try to clean this um, distance, uh, make it empty, we lose the sound, we neglect the sound. Uh, so this is the statement of the second uh, meta-narrative, uh, right? That we neglect the sound if we try to uh, distance ourself, uh, ourselves from the uh, object that we are uh, trying to understand. Uh, I decided to call this uh, meta-narrative uh, a romantic meta-narrative because it romanticizes sound and listening. It says that sound is completely different from the visual and thus cannot be studied and described in visual terms. In order to reach the sound as such and to overcome this dominating visual ideology, we need to listen, to listen subjectively, to put aside all the epistemological restriction, restrictions and so on and so on. Um, so here we have this very strong political implication of um, sonic studies. Right, because uh, sound is uh, the voice, uh, be given the voice means uh, be represented, uh, be not allowed, not be allowed uh, to speak means being oppressed, right? And this very important political, um, uh, political uh, fundamental idea uh, lies um, inside this uh, romantic meta narratives. For all the unjust, unhealthy, unequal, and violent things in our world, there is an explanation. People have not been listening to each other attentively enough. And uh, for, uh, to, to all these problems, there is a recipe how to get rid of them. 
and the recipe is listen. And you remember Ryman Murashafer um, with his a poster, listen, right, with his uh, um, like inspiring uh, speeches about that we need to listen. So this second meta narrative has a very strong and unquestionable point. Ethically, this is exactly what we what we need today, uh, because it is compatible with both colonial, feminist, uh, ecological, uh, theoretical framework uh, that proved to be really necessary today. Uh, but speaking about ontology, we need to admit that romantic meta narrative meta narrative does not rescue us from ideology as such. Um, it rescues us from visual ideology, but instead of this uh, visual ideology, it uh, imposes another ideology, ideology of listening. Uh, so ontologically, even though uh, these um, meta-narratives perform mutually exclusive understanding of sound, uh, they presuppose and reproduce the same basic premises. The first one is um, audiovisual binary opposition. Um, it might be clear that the romantic meta narrative performs this opposition, and this is what Jonathan Stern uh, calls audiovisual littleness, presupposes this distinction as well. Uh, even though it does uh, it a little bit differently, um, it considers sound to be a natural force which is uh, distinct from uh, other natural for forces, uh, for example, from image. Uh, so audio and visual constitute an opposition which, though, uh, is being reduced. So audio is being reduced to the visual. But nevertheless, this opposition uh, is presupposed, right? So it exists, uh, but it is being resolved into um, or by uh, reducing uh, sonic to the visual. Um, the second proposition that... that um, is reproduced by both. It's obvious, on the contrary, that sonic naturalism presupposes this opposition um, because the distance between human object and um, the uh, inhuman, uh, I'm sorry, a human subject and inhuman object, conscious uh, subject and unconscious object, and so on and so on. Uh, so this uh, opposition is very crucial for um, naturalism. But um, my point is that romantic uh, meta narrative also keeps this opposition. In sonic romanticism, this opposition exists in a form of another dilemma um, that is, sound listening dilemma. So, sound listening dilemma is a kind of um, uh, type of uh, this uh, subject object op opposition or reincarnation of this opposition in romantic. Uh, meta narrative. Um, so, among others, among other thinkers, uh, this dilemma was formulated by Brian Kane. Uh, he explicated two approaches in already existing sound studies and showed uh, that there are subject centered approaches and object centered approaches. Uh, so, sound um, centered, um, uh, sorry, subject centered approaches focus on uh, listening, while object centered approaches try to avoid uh, studying listening and address sound itself. Uh, so, this is what we know under the name of ontological um, turn uh, in sound studies. Uh, so, he shows that this ontological turn, um, well, turns out to be. Uh, not as successful as it could have been, but nevertheless, we are interested in this uh, difference, right, in this opposition. Uh, these uh, two uh, approaches are being, uh, like, pronounced. Um, so what Kane means is partly different from what I highlighted above as meta-narratives, because as I said, um, naturalist meta-narrative uh, does not... Um, uh, like uh, associate itself uh, with uh, sound studies, right? And Brian Kane speaks about two different approaches inside sound studies. Uh, but um, nevertheless, what he calls uh, or what he addresses um, under the name of um, ontological turn uh, is a contemporary attempt to uh, go back to a realistic question to question 
um, that uh, could have been abandoned and could have been um, uh, banned for um, some period of time. Uh, actually, to go back to the question of naturalistic um, meta narrative, but uh, with this critical uh, understanding that we cannot do that uh, in a naive way, right? Um, so uh, I consider this um, oppositions, even though they might sound a little bit um, complicated, I consider them to be very uh, symptomatic of this uh, binary um, differences that um, uh, that predetermine our logic while um, studying the sonic. Um, so um, even though the two meta narratives that I outlined um, uh, above uh, hold opposite positions, they have a lot in common. Uh, they share and reconstitute all the ontological uh, assumptions and all these binary oppositions, uh, which means that they play one and the same game, but for different teams. Um, and even though romantic meta narrative posed an explicit goal of freeing sound from reduction to the visual, uh, which was crucial to naturalism, it put sound in a different reductionist logic. Uh, in romanticism, sound is being reduced to listening, uh, which means uh, being reduced to the access uh, to sound that people have, right? So if we um, uh, like take into account all the critique towards uh, the ontological term, then we can speak about um, uh, the general direction, the general um, like assumption that uh, is being reproduced in sound studies. So this is reduction of a sound to listening. Um, so, um, and being reduced to listening means being re reduced to human listening, right? So uh, here we have a lot of other uh, implications that might be not as obvious from uh, the first attempt to think about them. Um, so I see all these uh, binaries and all these reductionisms as a very important uh, or very dramatic, I can say, uh, constraint for uh, thinking uh, about sound for sound research. So what I'm going to do next is uh, outline a um, possible way out, as it seems to me, a framework that does not uh, force us to reproduce those classical oppositions. Um, so here I need to introduce multisensory research um, or multisensory approach, uh, it would be better to say. A multisensory approach is a relatively recent a tendency in perceptual studies. Uh, which though has already um, affected different fields uh, like uh, marketing, urban studies, design, medicine, pedagogy, etc. So a lot of pub publications uh, on the topic of multisensory perception um, have already been published um, inside these spheres, but most of them are aimed at commercial um, goals at commercial profit because it is very uh, easy to affect and to manipulate uh, the consumer knowing how this uh, multisensory perception works, how can you effectively um, like uh, make person react in a, in a specific way to different uh, sensory stimuli. But uh, among these uh, works, uh, there are some theoretical ones, uh, the ones that um, address the theoretical uh, perspectives of this uh, epistemological approach. Uh, and um, from the name of philosophy, uh, there are works of Casey O'Callaghan, so uh, this is um, maybe one of uh, the very, a very small number of people who have already addressed uh, this topic in such um, theoretical uh, level. Um, and his recent book was devoted to multisensory uh, perception directly. 
Um, in that book, he pays attention to the fact that by default, uh, theories of perception approached um, different uh, sensory modalities separately, uh, one at a time. Uh, he calls it a um, unisensory perspective. And as he admits, uh, quote, uh, this treatment reflects two implicit assumptions. The first is that each sense is explanatorily independent from the others. The second is that the sum of theorizing about individual senses yields a complete account of sensory perception, unquote. Um, it seems to O'Callaghan, and I share here his concerns, uh, that these assumptions are too abstract and too logical. Uh, to be true and to adequately describe how our perception works. Uh, so multisensory perspective considers these assumptions to be irrelevant to the actual sensory experience that we might have. So what does it mean to consider perception multisensorily? Uh, it means that our uh, perception and our experience uh, is always complex. It is constituted by sophisticated interconnections between different sensory modalities. What modalities um, uh, do we consider and how many modalities do we consider uh, is an open question. And there are different opinions on that, different theories. Um, but there is uh, the very, uh, a very common one uh, that is being used uh, very um, often. And it is the classical five modality schematism that goes back to ancient Greece, to Aristotle, or at least as we know it uh, by the works that we have today. Um, and uh, according to that schematism, there are, I'm sorry, no, I need to go back, uh, that there are uh, five sensory modalities and uh, we all know them from kindergarten, right? It's sight, sound, uh, taste, smell, and touch. And uh, this complex constellation of them is called sensorium. Uh, but as um, I just have said, uh, this five modality concept is not the only possible one. And there are um, alternative understandings of uh, sensorium. Uh, from a biological point of view, we have uh, other forms of experience that also have uh, some specific uh, places inside our bodies that are responsible for this uh, type of experience. So even uh, from the point of view of biology, uh, our uh, sensory experience is much uh, richer than this five uh, sensory, um, five modality uh, theory might uh, show us. So among this, uh, there are senses like proprioception, blood pressure, different types of pain. Um, and here I want to address one book uh, called Culture and the Senses, Bodily Ways of Knowing in an African Community, uh, where the author um, discusses uh, this uh, five sense modality and uh, describes uh, first uh, her conversation with her American students and then her field research in uh, West Africa. So she uh, asked her American students to list uh, like senses that they have and they listed um, five senses and some of them sometimes uh, added one more sense, the sixth sense. And this is um, unsurprisingly uh, the thing that we are used to because of uh, popular culture uh, used to as uh, intuition or something extra perceptual and so on. But on the contrary, in uh, during her field research in West Africa, she um, uh, noticed that uh, there is a very specific uh, sense that uh, um, representatives of Western culture do not even think about from uh, the first uh, for, for the first time, uh, and for uh, people uh, of Anlo land, uh, Anlo Ivy people, um, she descri uh, describes this uh, people. Um, for them, there is a very important sense that, um, according to their outlook, uh, constitute uh, what does it mean to be a human, and this is the sense of balance. Uh, 
So she writes uh, about that in an ironic way as about a sixth sense, and this is the sense of balance. But what uh, is so important um, about her work? It is important uh, to understand that our sensoriums uh, are culturally, uh, culturally changeable, first of all, uh, that they change from culture to culture, and it really depends what uh, senses are you used to, are you taught uh, to experience, to notice, and to be aware of. And um, secondly, uh, sensorium, uh, according to her research, is a concept that is not just um, that is not just a scientific um, uh, uh, a scientific matter, right? It is very important from the point of view of anthropology because a sensorium is uh, our understanding what uh, does it mean to be a human? And she actually understood that in non-Western culture. Uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of different problematic things like uh, 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 the very notion of human or the very notion of notion, right? But nevertheless, uh, we see that uh, this uh, matter, this topic is, uh, might be of um, like bigger importance than uh, we are used to think. Um, so uh, along with cultural changeability, we need to presume um, that uh, sensoriums are also changeable and uh, they also reconstruct themselves depending on specific life conditions and contexts. Um, so we are not only culturally determined but also situationally determined. Um, one short example that we are all um, very well acquainted with um, is pandemic. Um, so this social catastrophe in an ironical way uh, played a very important role in our questioning the visual um, logic that um, still dominates uh, experience of uh, many, many people in the globalized world. So it questioned oculocentrism of uh, the Western culture. Uh, the sense uh, which used to be the leading one uh, in Western sensorium, um, that is vision, the most trustworthy, the most reliable, um, this sense became um, unable to provide us with reliable uh, knowledge. It became unable to tell us whether we are safe or not. Um, as long as virus cannot be seen with eyes, um, and uh, as long as an infected person might not have any uh, visually recognizable symptoms, uh, other senses uh, in this uh, situation uh, sometimes took the leading role. Uh, so listening, for example, listening attentively to uh, coughing, sneezing uh, people to their breath uh, became very important to uh, diagnose, right, to understand uh, whether uh, there is any threat to our health or not. So we became more aware of this sonic uh, phenomena around us. Uh, or smell, uh, there are specific smells that previously uh, maybe were not uh, the, the favorite ones like alcohol that is, um, that is being put into all the sanitizing pro uh, products. Uh, now it um, became a very important, uh, once again, very important feature in the environment, which uh, showed us that um, everything is clean, that everything is safe, that someone cares about us, about our health, about our life. Uh, so we see that uh, uh, in this context, um, sensorium reconstructed itself and uh, some senses that previously were unimportant or even neglected or even forgot or oppressed, uh, they uh, became the most important one, the most reliable one. And this very uh, crisis of visual uh, reliability, some people called it like this, uh, it really happened to us um, and um, put, our, uh, put an emphasis on this situational character of uh, sensorium. Uh, 
this situational, culturally changeable, adaptive, and flexible uh, sensorium, as it is understood in multisensory approach, uh, remind, uh, reminded me of a well-known uh, epistemology proposed by Donna Harway under the name of um, situational knowledges. Um, Donna Haraway's visionary uh, 1980s works anticipated uh, many ontological shifts and many ontological problematics that are being elaborated now. Um, and through the topics of cyber organization, feminism, and companion species, uh, she problematized the subject object opposition, nature culture opposition, etc. And she spoke about visuality as well and visual uh, knowledge, right? Visual ideal of knowledge. Uh, in her classical article about situated knowledge, uh, knowledges, uh, she uh, addressed this classical paradigm of objective knowledge and showed that it is very much con um, constituted uh, by gaze. Um, so this is a paradigm that is built upon a gaze from nowhere, a gaze that is not situated anywhere because this is a gaze that um, does not belong to um, an actual uh, being, right? It belongs to pure reason, we can say. Um, so what she proposed uh, instead was uh, situated knowledge. Um, she says, uh, quote, only partial perspective promises objective vision. Feminist objectivity is about limited location and situated knowledge, not about transcendence and splitting of subject and object." Unquote. Um, in my opinion, recollecting the concept of situated knowledges as an epistemological basis for multisensory research is what can give a boost to a situational, um, situational ontology. Uh, that Marie Thompson proclaimed in her well-known critique of ontological turn uh, in sound studies, um, in her article, uh, Whiteness and the Ontological Turn in Sound Studies, uh, she spoke um, about this matter. And uh, even though she critiqued, uh, criticized the already existing um, ontological approaches in sound studies, she said that it is not ontology that we do not need per se, as it is, right? We do need ontology, but we need a different ontology. So it seems to me that all this combination of Haraway's um, multisensory and flat um, approaches might constitute a um, more adequate ontology. So how does multisensory theory of perception enhance our understanding of experience? Uh, one of the most important achievements of multisensory theory is the hierarchization of senses. Uh, if we return to meta narratives that I was speaking um, uh, earlier, uh, speaking about earlier, uh, we might notice that they presuppose this hierarchy for the naturalistic meta narrative. Vision is highest, uh, is higher than um, uh, any other uh, sense. For um, romantic meta narrative, um, listening is higher than any other sense. Um, and um, to dethrone either of the leading modalities, we need a different uh, ontological approach, right? And uh, this uh, multisensory approach uh, puts emphasis uh, differently, which actually does not leave any um, space um, any possibility of prioritizing, essentially prioritizing any sense um, and put, uh, putting it uh, above all the rest, right? So we understand that everything is situational, that there are no uh, leading essences, um, essentially leading essences. Um, so um, multisensory theory is a way to get rid of uh, reductional, uh, reductionist thinking, right? So earlier I spoke about um, two approaches reducing uh, sound either to the visual or to listening. And uh, this dehierarchization of senses, it um, gives us an opportunity to overcome this reductionist logic. Uh, through the idea that sensorium is flexible, changeable, and situational, a multisensory theory escapes from naturalization of senses and thus from fixed constellations of senses. 
so in one situation, it might be vision that leads. In another situation, it might be listening. In third situation, it might be order sense uh, or smell. Uh, in fourth, uh, it might be several senses at once uh, that are equally involved uh, and so on and so on. So it depends on the environment, on the mood, on the task um, that one uh, has at a specific uh, moment uh, or the attention, what is it being paid to and so on. So sensorium constantly reconstructs itself, adapts, um, which helps us um, get rid of this hierarchical and uh, reductionist way of thinking. So going back to flag ontologies that I started my speech with, it seems to me that multisensory um, that multisensory theory of perception is the only possible epistemology for flat ontologies. So uh, these are uh, flat ontologies and multisensory epistemologies are uh, the two sides of one and the same coin. Uh, these are ontology and epistemology inside one and the same philosophy. Um, I think it is necessary to emphasize um, one thing that might be unclear at this, um, at this moment. Uh, it might seem that flat ontologies and multisensory epistemologies believe that asymmetries, asymmetries do not exist, right? And I spoke about that earlier, but I want to remind you once again that uh, this is not true, right? Because these approaches work on two different levels, on ontological level where everything is uh, equal and on ontic level where these um, asymmetries and differences still exist. As uh, Bruno Latour, uh, said, uh, we need to learn how to think symmetrically in order to see the asymmetries. Uh, so we need to accept ontological equality in order to see clearly or to understand clearly, sorry once again for the visual metaphor, uh, to understand clearly all the asymmetries that we have, that we might face, uh, that haunt our world. So once again, if we speak about perception, all the senses, including the ones that we are not even aware of, are equal. They equally exist, they equally act, uh, they have equal um, capacities and abilities to involve into our perception. Um, but in each case, depending on plenty of factors, uh, they constitute a situational asymmetry, a structure where some senses play a bigger role than the others. But this is once again has nothing to do right these differences this uh, inequality has nothing to do with their ontological statues um, and returning to the meta narratives that i spoke about earlier the naturalistic and the romantic meta narratives uh, this is uh, there is one drawback of uh, a romantic meta narrative that still stays in multi-sensory approach and this is subject to centrism uh, multisensory approach widens understanding of sound perception and does not reduce it to listening, uh, but uh, at the same time it, um, it uh, reduces sound to uh, perception, right? Even though this is multisensory perception, it is still perception. That is, means we have this perceiving subject in the center of this understanding. Um, so being interpreted as an epistemological theory compatible with ontologies though, uh, multisensory theory does not presuppose this limitation anymore. So flat ontologies balance the subject centrism of multisensory perspective and um, like help us uh, not concentrate on this fixed subject that might, uh, as it might seem um, without considering flat ontologies, right? Because flat ontologies are realistic ontologies. Uh, they allow us to speak about objects themselves um, and do that phenomenologically. So they start with personal experience. They do not neglect personal experience. They start with it and then move towards the perceived phenomenon. Uh, that is why we do not have to stop on uh, the level of sensory analysis. Rather, we need to move forward. Uh, and the more, uh, and one more consequence that I want to uh, speak about, uh, the consequence of this flat um, ontological um, approach, uh, is uh, that we do not uh, need to restrict 
um, our considerations to uh, the domain of human, right? So a human being is not a privileged being anymore. And uh, along with the human being, there are other things that exist in the world, things in a very broad sense, uh, other uh, creatures, other entities that exist in the world and that also do perceive the world multisensorily. They also have different senses. Uh, we might not know um, uh, how to um, uh, how to describe their sensoriums at this very moment, but it does not uh, mean that we do not have any access to that, that we don't have any uh, opportunity to do that in the future um, as soon as we uh, reconsider and reconstruct our theoretical instruments. Um, so having understood all the drawbacks of existing strategies of uh, reducing sound to one sensory modality, we need to think about the perspectives of multisensory theory uh, of sound. Uh, so sound, uh, uh, we need to think how to uh, consider sound so that it is not a mere effect of um, an existing object. So that sound is ontologically um, uh, true, right, let's say. So this means that we need uh, to understand sound multisensorily. So we need to understand that it is being perceived multisensorily as long as it is a um, uh, standalone phenomena. Uh, it uh, reveals uh, itself to us uh, through uh, different um, uh, uh, in different ways, right? Through different modalities. Um, so even in such cases as reduced listening or acosmatic listening, uh, we just have a very specific constellation of sensorium. Um, even in case of sensory impairment, such as blindness or deafness, we still have multisensory system, but multisensory system that works in a very specific way. So sound is a multisensory phenomenon and we need to study it multisensorily. Uh, of course, for this new approach, we need to reconsider our standing, uh, our own, our standing of uh, senses because this five uh, sense uh, understanding, which still persists, uh, is not adequate and we need to reconsider it. And this is an open question, but uh, nevertheless, I uh, think that uh, this point is already a very um, interesting point to start a new discussion, a new uh, language, a new uh, uh, explanatory um, approach uh, to sound and sonic phenomena. So I would like to conclude my speech with a very short prognostic intuition. So sound studies is a relatively young field and I am convinced that it is still um, on its way to um, elaborating um, um, an explicit uh, understanding of what uh, does, um, what is included, what might be included into it and what might, might, might not, right? Um, so for some period of time, this meta-narrative dilemma was um, a way to define this difference. Right, to perform meta, uh, romantic meta-narrative meant uh, to be uh, inside this uh, critical um, field. Uh, to perform um, naturalistic meta-narrative meant uh, to miss something very important about uh, sound and uh, sonic experience. But now it seems to me that the meta-narrative dilemma as well as further confrontation between romantic approaches and this attempts to build an ontology of sound, uh, all of these confrontations have already fulfilled their heuristic task. This task was extremely important, but uh, it seems to me that this task is already fulfilled. So uh, we do not need to reproduce this um, binary uh, positions anymore and we can start um, a new discussion uh, using the new language. So the language that I'm proposing is uh, this combination of flat ontologies, multisensory epistemologies uh, that are being understood as a situational uh, theory of uh, like understanding. 
of the world. So here I would like to stop because my time is actually up and I am very much looking forward to any uh, feedback from you, any considerations, any ideas and questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your lecture and the well described and explained details. Uh, I think it was wonderful. But um, by the end of the lecture, I was thinking like when you propose this idea of multisensory epistemology and a flat ontology and saying that we don't need to speak about vision or sound as uh, ultimate sensory, uh, I don't know how to say, items. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, so why we need sound studies at all as a field of study that distinguishes sound from other sensorium parts? Uh, that's a very interesting question and a very essential question for sound studies, right? <laughs> because we are here and uh, we want to do something, we want to do something specific and do you want to affiliate ourselves uh, with something specific? Well, it seems to me that there is no threat to sound studies at all. Uh, because sound studies uh, in this um, understanding, uh, in this approach, uh, sound studies uh, might give us a language to, uh, like to approach uh, sound. Um, I am really afraid to say in itself, but well, <laughs> this is exactly what I mean. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I know it's a bit weird and like kind of global question <laughs> and essential, but I uh, wanted to ask it. And uh, we have one more question and I'm going to post it in chat and then read it out loud. So everyone who's watching on you could also hear that. It's one of the most common critique comments on the flat ontologies, the object-oriented ontology, et cetera, is that even if we say things such as all objects are equal and that human doesn't belong to the center of the universe anymore, we still people making judgments. So it's still quite anthropocentric as it's a theory conceived by humans. How sound studies might become the key for solving this issue. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this question. Uh, this is a really important uh, critique. Uh, this is a critique that um, makes us um, address uh, once again uh, this distinction between uh, ontic and ontological, right? And it is important to uh, realize, uh, especially for those who criticize flat ontologies for this, uh, it is important to remember that flat ontologies start with recognizing that we have this position, right, that we do not uh, try to uh, speak as we do not have it. Uh, so that is why uh, this is um, a methodologically, this is a phenomenological approach. Uh, so, um, uh, which means uh, that even, well, actually, uh, let's put it in a little bit different way. Uh, well, having this position does not uh, limit our um, epistemological um, possibilities, right? So we just do, um, we just produce knowledge, we just uh, try to understand, we just try to learn um, with this uh, cognition that we are humans and we are speaking from our point of view, that we have our bodies, that we are uh, somehow limited to these bodies and uh, so on and so on. Uh, so the question is how sound studies might become the key for solving this issue. Um, that is a good question and I am not sure whether I am ready to answer it, but um, the intuition that I have, uh, well, mostly I was speaking today about how um, these philosophical approaches might uh, help sound studies, right? Uh, and the question is put vice versa. And this is a very interesting. Uh, but I have some intuition that sound is um, one of the objects uh, that um, are very uh, difficult to catch uh, with uh, the outdated classical way of understanding. So the work 
objects that were pretty easy to um, study this way in a classical way, right? But there are some complex objects and objects that uh, this um, classical uh, methodologies um, like fail to work with. And it seems to me that finding these objects and trying to approach them in any way is uh, very, very productive for uh, trying to find a way out from this uh, constraints uh, in our human bodies. Well, um, I'm sorry for not ask, answering this question actually, because it is, yes, it is very, very uh, difficult. And um, I do not unfortunately have um, like um, uh, made, uh, already made an um, answer to it, but it's a very interesting thing to uh, think about, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I know it's kind of hard to answer one way and be for sure, even when we're speaking like about sound studies and saying that there is no concrete and stable and state position that we are standing on. And we have one more question, which is, uh, this is a rather personal one question. So sound studies is a being one of the most multidisciplinary academic fields of studies and the urbanism as well. Is it somehow relevant to your personal academic uh, history, meaning that you've been studying and teaching urbanism and later switched to thinking about the sonning and titles and writing about it? So shortening this one, how did you become interested in sound studies and maybe what it gave it to you? Uh, thank you for such a personal question. Well, it's a big honor <laughs> to be asked such a question because uh, it is uh, always an honor to understand that someone is interested in your personal issues. So thank you for asking. Um, well, actually, um, it works a little bit differently. So uh, first of all, this question is very closely connected to my attempt um, to answer the previous one because when I said that there are difficult um, uh, objects that we fail to uh, study with the classical approaches, I meant um, city as well, right? because uh, sound and city, these are the uh, objects because of my academic um, uh, like trajectory, these are the objects that come up to my mind uh, first. Um, and while answering this question, uh, uh, actually when I was um, a student, at uh, School of Urbanism, at the Sarkovsky Graduate School of Urbanism, I started uh, studying sound. So um, the topic of my master research was uh, sound in the city. And um, some um, I uh, approached it firstly from the point of view of uh, acoustic ecology and uh, some critique of uh, acoustic ecology. And um, this is how I found this uh, endless topic and this field which uh, we are speaking today about as um, sound studies. Uh, so uh, these two uh, things, these two uh, disciplines are like uh, multidisciplinary fields are very closely interconnected uh, for me and um, I, um, I uh, maybe I might say that I was always think, um, trying to find uh, a very complicated questions which do not have uh, simple answers. And this is how I came uh, from the field of philosophy to urban studies. And this is how in the field of urban studies, I came to studying sound. So this is maybe the most complicated thing that can exist, <laughs> studying sound in uh, the context of city uh, through the lens of philosophy. Yes, but this is very encouraging and very inspiring, isn't it? Such difficult questions. <laughs> yeah, and we have one more. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, you mentioned the works of Raymond Murray Schaefer. And don't you think that himself and other acoustic ecologists are somehow being alarmist about the current situation? Like there is Schaefer living somewhere in the middle of nowhere, staying away from the civilization and yet saying that it's too late. 
maybe him and other acoustic sonic ecologists should somehow learn from the flat ontologists as well. And for example, it might be interesting in the light of Timothy Morton, dark ecology. Yeah, thank you very much for this um, question. Um, in some uh, point, yes, I agree with this uh, characteristics as like alarmist. Um, yes, I um, agree that such um, uh, such a, uh, how do we call it? Well, such a tonality uh, does really sound in those uh, works and their discourse. But it seems to me that um, uh, acoustic ecology is valuable uh, not from the point of view of theory, but from the point of view of uh, practice. And actually, this is once again where we come to this uh, double uh, layered um, ontological um, like understanding of the world, right? Because even though uh, we do have this uh, like flat um, uh, ontological uh, understanding, we still have a lot of uh, problems that we need to solve somehow here and now. And here, actually, alarmist um, approaches and alarmist discourses work pretty well because they uh, attract our attention to the real problems that we need to solve, uh, that we need to address directly, that we need to invest money into, that we need to speak about. And it seems to me that these two um, uh, processes are both very valuable for um, enhancing uh, and uh, like changing our lives uh, for better. Um, of course, uh, all the uh, discourses about whether uh, cities sound bad or whether they sound good, they all are very um, relative, right? Uh, they all are very, once again, culturally uh, determined because the notion of norm, the notion of um, comfort, uh, it is a very subjective uh, notion and it really depends, it really changes um, uh, depending on different um, uh, different uh, like uh, situational uh, conditions and so on. But um, I agree that if we uh, consider this uh, discourse as a theoretical discourse, it has a lot of drawbacks. It has a lot of um, like failures from the point of view of flat ontologies, but if we speak about it as um, uh, like um, uh, instruction to actions, right, as a recipe to change something here and now, uh, it might turn out to be very productive. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you so much for your answer. And I think that is the best time to conclude our Q&A session. And thanks again for your lecture and for answering all the questions. And thanks everybody else who came today and who made this event possible. And I'm inviting you to join us tomorrow for another lecture and check out the next uh, lectures and events on our website and follow our social media and thank you so much again goodbye thank you so much <laughs>